For 15 years, the coral reefs of Uva and Sika Islands have been a laboratory of study for scientists from the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Peter Glynn and his colleagues have now refocused their studies to determine the cause of a deadly mystery on the reef. These reefs are a microcosm of life on Earth. Thousands of species living together, all of them dependent on a type of plankton that live in the coral. But early in 1983, disaster struck here as well. During the same period in which weather went wild on land, the symbiotic plants that live inside the tissue of the coral died and streamed off. In places, the reef is beginning to recover, but great parts still remain devastated. Studying its rebirth, Glynn is looking for the cause of the coral's death. He first suspected that the destruction was triggered by man-made pollution. Once the die-off had begun, the crown of thorns starfish moved in to further decimate the coral. The feisty little guardian shrimp that normally protect the reef could not stop them. But there was little evidence of pollution. Something else had attacked the hardy reef, perhaps an abrupt temperature change. A temperature change could be connected to El Nino, a warming trend known to disrupt the waters off Peru. There, warm waters raise the temperature above the tolerance for life. After measuring the temperature of the surrounding water, it seemed a theory worth testing in the laboratory. We have an example here of a tank where the water temperatures are about normal. And you can see in this coral that uh, it is golden brown in color. It has plants that live in the tissues symbiotically. And uh, this is the normal situation uh, with normal seawater temperatures. Now, in 1983, the seawater temperatures were higher than normal for two to three months. We have duplicated the warming conditions. And you can see that the brown color has left the coral skeleton. And we still have a little bit of the normal coral on top, but considerable bleaching and loss of the algae below. We are probably duplicating the coral bleaching and death that we actually observed in the Eastern Pacific Ocean during 1983. Glenn and his team returned to the reef. Coral grows outward like trees. Only the surface is alive, and beneath it is layer upon layer of earlier generations. In the towering coral heads, some of them 400 years old, there may be a record of past catastrophes. Glynn now believes that El Nino is the cause of the devastation. If so, the samples taken from the coral should match the history of past warming events. And the pattern of the past may be a clue to when El Nino will next come to the reef. El Nino, the child, so named because the warming event is observed near Christmas time. Though recorded for nearly 200 years, its cycle is highly irregular. Scientists are only now beginning to understand its basic mechanics. Instruments aboard a satellite can read the changing surface temperature of the ocean, including the waters off South America. Off Peru, there is a rich upwelling of cold water. But every few years at Christmas time, a layer of warm water thickens in the Eastern Pacific cutting off the nutrient-rich water in which plankton live. They die, and the entire cycle of life breaks down. A satellite study of El Nino has been conducted at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Robert Bernstein, plotting the surface temperature of the ocean, has pieced together a map from 1982 and 83. His study covers the entire Pacific Ocean. On the monitor are two maps of the Pacific. Normal conditions for December are above, the El Nino year below. Temperature is shown by color, 
blue and green the coolest, orange and red the warmest. The upwelling is a tongue of cool blue water that extends outward from the coast of South America. But in 1983, it is capped and snuffed out as the water temperature rises as much as 15 degrees Fahrenheit. These unusual conditions are not confined to South America. Far to the west, there have also been dramatic changes. Some disturbance has occurred between the sea and the air in the western Pacific, and weather in the ocean and the atmosphere has shifted eastward by a full hemisphere. The dramatic disturbance is reflected in the atmosphere. Satellite photos above the Pacific show how the normal cloud patterns of the trade winds break into disarray. Scientists realize these fluctuations are far larger than just a warming trend off South America. These oscillations in the Southern Ocean are even connected to the monsoons in Asia and play havoc with the weather of nearly 70% of the world. In late 1984, an international symposium is convened in Paris. From around the world, scientists come together to sort through the global implications of the discovery. And that's a major project. Australia had some very severe droughts, in particular in places which normally don't have drought. Now in the Philippines, the El Nino has done a devastating effect very recently when two typhoons passed through the country within a period of 10 days that devastated the country and cost millions and millions of dollars. All the major droughts in India, in fact, some of the major famines in India, they were all occurred during the El Nino years. A decade of research begins to explore the intricate connections between the ocean and the atmosphere. The goal, to learn how and when air and sea go out of balance, and to predict when it might occur again, before another massive El Nino strikes. The study is named TOGA, Tropical Oceans and Global Atmosphere. The research vessel Discoverer embarks on the first voyage in a decade of study that will involve over 50 countries, hundreds of vessels, and thousands of researchers. Because of its huge size, oceanographic information on the Pacific is far from adequate. Toga promises to add dramatically to the knowledge scientists now have of the globe's largest ocean. Data recording buoys that radio information to land will be stationed across the Pacific. The weather of the atmosphere changes daily, but the ocean has a memory. Its weather may continue over months or years. Researchers will investigate just how one affects the other. A buoy is launched, and the most comprehensive study of how the oceans and atmosphere interact begins. Floating sentinels in the Pacific may shed light on events that affect the lives of millions. And scientists may discover that ocean and atmosphere are one continuous system, from the top of the sky to the floor of the deep sea. In legend, Alexander the Great was lowered into the depths. Inside his crystal sphere, he became the first traveler to observe the wondrous and strange creatures that inhabit the ocean. In this century, the trip was repeated by inventor Otis Barker and the zoologist William Beebe. Their bathysphere was made not of crystal, but steel. From more than one half mile deep, the explorers described fantastic fish that live at the edge of perpetual darkness. Unable to photograph what they saw, they relayed their descriptions to an artist on deck. The paintings appeared in the pages of the National Geographic magazine, life forms seen for the first time. Fanged and luminescent, they too seemed like creatures born in legend. Thank you. 